this piece was called Runnin', as you saw. Um, we, obviously, I love this piece. I've danced that song like four times a week. And uh, this premiered at Sundance in January of this year. And then we also brought it to South by Southwest, where it won the award for best in interactivity in the virtual cinema. And what I want to talk through is kind of how we got from nothing to something. Because I think creative content in the immersive media space is sometimes a really a bit of a black box. And that's what I'm going to talk through over the next first 10 minutes. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about Intel Studios at large. So you cannot start talking about Runnin' without mentioning our writer-director, Kira Bensing. So Kira Bensing is actually a New York native, and uh, I'm sure some folks in the audience might know her. And she had this idea around creating a virtual reality experience that enlivened the spirit and was joyful and playful and really centered on dance and human performance. And to that point, she, with luck, met Reggie Watts, actually at Sundance of 2017, so, or 20, yeah, it's early 2018, sorry. And it just so happened that Reggie had just published a new record with his musical collaborator, John Tejada. And it turns out also, which I would not have known, uh, that Reggie is a huge VR geek. He is a bigger VR geek than I am, and I'm in this space. So he was thrilled with the idea of taking his music and allowing people to be completely immersed in it. We al they also then brought on a uh, producer, Adam Rogers, who's really well known for producing incredible VR musical experiences. And the four of them put their heads together about really what did they want this piece to be. And it all founded around this idea of really capturing human performance, right? And bringing that joy of dance into the headset. So at that point, they started evaluating production options. So in virtual reality, there's fundamentally been two production options. The first is real-time animation. Real-time animation is kind of what you can imagine. It's an animated environment. And uh, the great thing about anim uh, real-time animation is that you, it can be fully interactive. However, it's really challenging to bring in a human performance. Generally, characters are human-like, but you don't want to get too close because you'll go into the dangerous, uncanny valley. Um, so the other option is 360 video. 360 video is great because it actually captures the entirety of that human performance, but it doesn't give you any of the interactivity that you need. And in particular, you're really just stationary, right? It's only three degrees of freedom, typically, rather than six degrees of freedom in which I can actually walk around my environment. Now, there is a third option, and that is volumetric video. And volumetric video is really emerging in this space. Now, this happens to be Jill, my coworker, who dances so beautifully. And the advantage of uh, being in volumetric video is that this data is actually 3D. So you can bring it into a Unity environment, make it fully interactive, and also capture the human performance. So both, best of both worlds. Now around the same time that Kira and Reggie were putting their heads together about how to create a great virtual reality dance experience, it just so happened that Intel Studios was launching with the largest scale volumetric capture stage in existence. We had just launched in January of 2018 at CES, and our core technical capability was this volumetric capture. We were also looking to push the boundaries on what it meant to do storytelling in immersive media. That was really what we were founded on, and I'll, I'll talk more about that at the, um, later on in the presentation. So when Reggie and Kira approached us on the idea of really breaking the mold in terms of what constituted a typical virtual reality experience, not a zombie shooter, uh, we were excited about the idea. Let's really bring something new to the market. So with that, in around August of last year, we launched pre-production. And boy, did we benefit from all of Kira's pre-thought into this uh, incredible experience because we did pre-production in just three weeks, which is really fast. That included casting and choreography and wardrobe 
and understanding what the blocking was gonna be on the stage. And that brought us to production day in September of 2018. So now about nine months ago. Production days at uh, Intel Studios can really run the gamut, but this one was really fun. One of the advantages of large scale volumetric capture is that you're able to put all of the performers on the stage together. And that energy of them feeding off of one another and dancing like nobody's watching, frankly, um, is, is really invigorating. So we had 12, some up to 14 dancers on the stage at the same time, which were all captured in the same scene. And we also then were able to take those pieces and create the volumetric video of them, which means that the output of this day is 3D content of the performance. With the 3D content of the performance, you can then take it into a development cycle to actually create your virtual reality experience. In post-production, that's where we take our, these 3D assets and integrate them into an environment that suits the creative des desires of the, the team. Uh, we were super lucky to work with a fantastic development team. They go by the name of Life Orange, uh, Tim, Ryan, and Sagar. And they built an incredible environment for these dancers to live in. The uh, scene opens with actually a, a kind of a record store, that's the upper right, um, where you actually instruct and educate the user on how both to teleport and to interact. And then we move into the disco dance party, as I like to refer to it. And that scene progresses piece by piece, somewhat like a music video, where it escalates in intensity and also introduces new elements um, every 15, 20 seconds. The final result is awesome. That's audio not from my presentation. <laughs> but I'm gonna talk about these videos. Which, anyways, the, you're getting to watch the best one. That's my mother. Um, she is reliving her Studio 54 days. Studio 54, Studio 54, Studio 54. And you can also see where I get my dancing skills. <laughs> So we brought this to Sundance and South By. Um, everybody dances in this thing. That is unheard of, right? I mean, you don't see virtual reality in which you have people getting so excited that they literally spontaneously dance with a headset on. Um, but he, he, this gentleman here works for the Princess of Denmark. Um, uh, you would think they might be more reserved. No. And. Uh, that was one of the reasons why we actually won the, the Interactivity Award, right? Being able to get people as engaged in this content as possible was, was our goal. And I, and I think that uh, Kira and Reggie and our technical teams really achieved that. So where do we go from here? Well, Renan debuted at South Sundance and South By, and we will do a couple more festivals um, in particular, if you're going to SIGGRAPH, uh, we will be at SIGGRAPH. We also are going to then take it into brighter, broader distribution. So uh, Intel Studios is a studio, fundamentally. Uh, that means that we're actually interested in having a commercial life for all of our pieces. And uh, that right now in virtual reality, location-based entertainment is one of the best options. So we're, gonna, we're already engaging with multiple location-based entertainment companies about licensing this content so that more people can experience it in the wild. Beyond that, we're also gonna look at distribution networks. This is things like Viveport and uh, Samsung VR. We may have to actually adjust the piece a little bit in order to make it work on those distribution platforms, but uh, we fundamentally wanna get as many people to see this piece and experience it as possible. What else is content for? So run-in is really just one piece of a much larger initiative effort. 
fundamentally, Intel Studios is interested in building a portfolio of immersive media experiences. And so we were founded with the idea of really coming forward and experimenting in this space and becoming a leader in immersive media storytelling. Now, at this point, I think as I come back up to kind of the 10,000, 20,000 foot level, I have to address the elephant in the room, which is Intel. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Intel is a company with decades of expertise in data-rich environments. And let me tell you, volumetric data is very big. We are an ambitious and agile group that we, and we try to leverage every piece of the Intel core ex expertise. One, we collaborate with their R&D departments. We are also getting data accelerators built into silicon, which is great. <laughs> if you've ever worked in 3D data, we're very excited about that. And our stage, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but our stage produces three terabytes of data per minute. That's 3,000 movies every minute coming off of my system. And our system is uh, quite differentiated in the space. We, this R stage is 10,000 square feet as opposed to most volumetric stages which are about 100 square feet. Those are really focused in individual capture. Ours is, uh, has always been geared towards capturing the entire performance. The stage today has about 100 cameras on it, 5K cameras. That's a lot of data. We capture all in, uh, this is a little technical, so some people, you can ignore this next statement. But we capture in RGB, we don't use active sensors. That's really differentiated for the space, and this is actually where our technology ties back in to the larger theme of this conference of AI and machine learning, because our system runs entirely on computer vision. Now, being able to do computer vision and then also skeletal recognition on top of all of our data that's a, that's a core capability for us, and th really driven by a lot of the work being done in AI. As I mentioned, we are a small and agile team. Uh, on most days, I would say we're about 20 people. And that's really uh, the majority of whom are uh, engineers and operations. We really have three business folks on the team, uh, myself, uh, head up all of business, business development, portfolio management. My head of product, Dave Smitty, who spoke at Volumetric Filmmaking for folks who were there. And uh, the GM of the studio and founder, Diego Perleski. Our other members of our team are core engineering, doing computer vision work, developing the AI algorithms that are really driving the system and operations. Uh, we were really lucky to be based in LA because we can pull from the entertainment industry and benefit from all of their expertise in actually producing our content. And our content is actually really diverse. So we are bringing on diverse sets of partners, not only in who, what type of company they are, but also in, in kind of what their objectives are. So for instance, Reggie Watts is a musician, comedian, jack of all trades, renaissance man, uh, and we were able to partner directly with him as an artist to create this experience which we brought to festivals and into the market. We're also working with Paramount Pictures. Paramount Pictures has been our partner actually since our launch and they're interested in breaking the fourth wall and understanding where is film and entertainment going. We're actually bringing a piece together with them to con in I think a week um, that is going to be a augmented reality piece. The, uh, the third one that I, I wanted to talk about is Soul and Science. So we've actually partnered directly with John Brankus, who is a freelance producer. And uh, together with him, we're able to change the way that we do sports storytelling. John was the voice and producer and brains behind ESPN Sports Science for three decades. Two decades. I shouldn't make him that old. He'd be really mad. The, um, and I think that it's important at this point also to point out that we're platform agnostic. Volumetric video can fuel a broad variety of experience platforms. So the run-in experience is virtual reality, six degrees of freedom, runs on a Vive. Um, we try to do wireless tracking if at all possible. 
Um, the Paramount experience is actually an augmented reality experience which runs on an iPad Pro. Uh, Soul and Science is producing uh, both a mobile interactive experience and a 2D experience because you're able to use a virtual camera inside of 2D in order to t do really unique storytelling. We, we use that actually in the, our partnerships with the NFL as well. And all of our content is storytelling centric. In my opinion, this is really, really important. You know, there are a lot of cool tech demos out there. Um, we are, as a studio, really oriented towards creating not just a cool tech demo, but fantastic experiences and stories that change the way people live. So to that end, I wanted to highlight one more time what is our lighthouse as Intel Studios? Intel Studios is one, a core technology capability in volumetric capture, but we are more than that, we aim to be, and will be, the home to the art of immersive media filmmaking. That is our lighthouse, and with every partnership that we do, we are actually exploring this boundary of what does that even mean? What are the tool sets that immersive media storytellers are using and how are we going to experience this content in the future? So with that, I want to thank everyone for their time. And I think I might have five minutes to do questions if there is a mic in the audience. Uh, I wondered if you could say something about your uh, sports venture and is that tied in with the NFL and soul and science and well, where's that going? Yeah, sure. So uh, this is, takes us a little bit deeper into Intel's overall investment in immersive media. So Intel, in addition to having Intel Studios, has a larger organization called Intel Sports. Intel Sports is partnered with the NFL, the NBA, La Liga, Arsenal, Liverpool, Man City. Uh, basically, you love the sport, we got them. And we have volumetric capture deployed in the stadiums directly. Uh, those are, that type of content is actually getting published largely through the leagues at this point. Uh, Brankus and our effort towards soul and science is to see what we can do as sports storytelling in a more controlled environment on our soundstage. So we have our partners from the NFL and from the sports side actually come to the studio and we'll capture content there and tell new and different stories. As you've described the technology so far, I would characterize it as crude and brute force. Mm. Now, you've got terabytes of data here with a relatively low value per voxel, but I'm guessing that you not only have very sophisticated data compression algorithms, but also ways to transform that data into something semantically more meaningful. Please comment. Can, can uh, let me hop in for one second and just tell you, you, everybody, you can get him back because he's going to be on the panel in just about an hour. <laughs> so yeah, take it away, Sarah. <laughs> so can, can you say first, uh, you mentioned that uh, I got distracted by crude and brute force. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Oh no, dance. it's beautiful. I love um, dancing. The so I'm going to be one of the first in line to put on this. <laughs> Absolutely. So you were saying that the you think that the, the you were asking about compression mechanisms, uh, specifically how we're working with point cloud. What, what direction do you want me to go? Well, I didn't mention point cloud, but. I'm a, I do a lot of programming, and it's very hard to program on, on the kind of data, directly programmed, yeah. interesting semantic stuff like em emerging other characters, et cetera, in such a complicated, huge amount of data. Yep. But if you can reduce that to you know, a few points on your body moving, yeah, sure. And it's a lot easier to detect collisions and do interesting semantic stuff for it. Got it. My guess is you've got a lot more technology behind this whole thing than you talked about so far. Copy that, yeah. So uh, there's really fundamentally, uh, there's volumetric reconstruction that's happening, which is done through computer vision, which is what I talked about here the next step on top of, which actually already reduces the total amount of data, right? Three terabytes of data is everything that comes off the system. Once we throw out all the backgrounds, it becomes 
significantly less, uh, which is good because three tire brides of data would not go anywhere, right? Um, the, uh, when you take the data into an environment, one of the first things we need to do is skeletal tracking that in allows a lot of different experiences. I would say that our skeletal tracking is in beta. Um, we, a lot of, we already know that it's the absolute next step. Um, we've also been open for about a year and a half. So the, uh, I think once we move to a world where we have really accurate skeletal tracking across the board, you'll see more of both VFX artists actually integrating their own components into the scene according to where the body positions are, but also a lot more of what you're talking about. I and mean, you could you could fake you know slow mo once you have skeletal tracking. There's all this fantastic stuff that you can do. Um, I went to a performance last night at. Uh, live Arts, and their Live Ideas Festival is part of uh, Creative Tech Week, as are lots of other um, creative technology-oriented performances and, and panels and shows across the city this week through the 19th. Um, they had uh, a bunch of cameras uh, arrayed around the ceiling, mm -hmm. uh, and they were doing live uh, interactive graphics on top of their dancers, contemporary dancers. And this was literally like probably the best um, one of the best performances I've ever seen and probably the best dance performance I've ever seen. When, when you start seeing this kind of thing happening in, um, in a performance setting, we're like, I mean, the, these videos were cool, but honestly, it just doesn't do it justice. Like, you have to actually see what's going on. I think that this whole technique is unbelievably groundbreaking. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think uh, our entertainment lives will change when this becomes the norm? Absolutely. I, I love that question. So one of the things that I think is potentially misconstrued is that people think this is going to replace film. It will not replace film. Film and TV and all of your fantastic Game of Thrones is here to stay, for sure. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to open up a completely new medium of how we experience content. And that's really exciting because it's like going from novels to film. When you open up the next level of immersion, what is the possibility to influence? Um, per personally, I think uh, I joke that if you want to augment intelligence, uh, the one of the best ways to do that is to augment experience. And if you're able to create new experiences for people that actually inform the way that they behave in day-to-day -day society, then maybe there's a chance to make the world a little bit of a better place. 